All right, Brother Chuck, thank you for that. All right, today we are going to conclude our uh, journey through the book of 1 Corinthians, and I know some of you are probably saying, finally, Pastor, but no, uh, it's been a great opportunity to preach through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're actually going to be talking about one of my favorite chapters today. But the meaning of love is, and its outworking has always been a point of contention with the masses in general. Uh, never mind within a Christian context. And for Christians, the idea of love is of great importance because, number one, the God we serve is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. We can only know how to love because God first loved us, according to the scripture, 1 John 4, 19. And we as believers are exhorted to love all, 1 John 4, 10. Apparently, you should go read 1 John chapter 4. Okay. And in this love chapter, as it's typically called in 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul tells his readers some very important things about love. He is writing to a church that, remember, we've journeyed through this whole book that has a whole lot of problems. They got a lot of different issues. And uh, in a very fatherly tone, Paul is going to tell his readers about the importance of love above all things. He's going to encourage them that everything that they do is to be flavored, as I could say it that way, with the idea of love, because without it being wrapped in love, then it is of no value. In 1 Corinthians 13, the word that Paul uses for love is really important. It's the word agape. In the Greek, in the New Testament, there are at least three other different words used for love, and this word for love is very important. The word agape is a deliberate love that is based upon choice by the one who loves rather than the worthiness of the one who receives the love. Agape is a God-type love. This type of love goes against all human inclination. It is giving. It is selfless. It expects nothing in return. It is a God-type love. This is the love that Paul is speaking about. And today, we are briefly going to go through this chapter, and we're going to see what Paul is telling the church at Corinth about this God-type love, and show why agape love is the greatest love and the greatest gift of all. I guess the Beatles were right when they said, all you need is love, right? I guess all you need is agape-type love, and that's right. Now, in case if you have not noticed already, we'll be in 1 Corinthians 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can open there now. We're going to see three things about this agape type love according to this chapter. And I'm going to cheat and give you the three things in advance. The first thing we're going to see really in verses 1 through 3 is that love is greater than the exercise of any spiritual gift. Paul is going to show how spiritual gifts, which we talked about last week, that's 1 Corinthians 12, that spiritual gifts, the use of them, have no value if they're not flavored, as we said, in love. Second thing we're going to see is that love is a verb. Now, going back to grammar school, what is a verb? A verb is an action term, right? That means that there's action associated with it. And Paul is going to talk about actions that characterize this God-type love. And then lastly, Paul is going to finish with the idea that love is supreme overall. He's going to compare a number of different things to love, and he's going to show why this agape love is supreme over all things. So buckle up your seats as we uh, continue on this journey. So the first thing we're going to see, as we mentioned already, is that love is greater than any spiritual gift. Let's pick up in verse 1. Paul says, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Let's pick up verse 3. It says, and if I give all of my possessions to feed the four and surrender my body to be burned. How many of you want to sign up for that? Right? And he says, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So we have to see this chapter in light of chapter 12, which we looked about, which we uh, explored last week. Because obviously Paul brings into the discussion right at the beginning a few different spiritual gifts that he mentioned already in chapter 12. And I want to revisit those with you briefly. He basically is showing us how fruitless and devoid of any value is if we exercise these spiritual gifts, but they're not based in love. He talks about speaking in tongues first. Remember that well, the way we defined that last week 
is it's the gift of speaking in an unlearned human language. The point is here that Paul's saying you can speak in tongues all day, but if you do not have love, then all you're doing is making a whole lot of noise. That's what he says. It sounds like clanging cymbals. Uh, secondly, Paul talks about the gift of prophecy. Paul has a very high view of prophecy. If you don't believe that, just peek over to the next chapter. In 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 5, he talks about how prophecy is such a great gift. But even if one is able to have the gift of prophecy, to be able to discern from God's word, and uh, be able to know all of these mysteries about God, it makes no point if love is not the basis of it. Paul talks about faith. And faith, the talking about here, is the faith that believers have for great miracles. Notice he says in verse 2, he says, faith so as to remove mountains. Where does that sound like I've heard that before? That's when Jesus himself says that. Paul described this faith as the ability to move mountains. This is the allusion to Mark chapter 11, verse 23, when it says that if we have faith to move mountains, that, that mountain would be cast into the sea. Well, even if we have that incredible faith to believe God for great things, if you do not have love, then it doesn't make any value. It has no sense. He talks about giving to the poor. He says, well, if I give everything that I own, basically, to the poor, he's talking about charity. So if I do all this charitable contributions, if I put my offering into the plate on Sunday morning, if I give more money and I give all my stuff and possessions to even other outside organizations, but I have not love, then it's no value. And lastly, he talks about giving his life for the cause of Christ. He says, if I be burned, right? That's basically talking about becoming a martyr. So even if I'm willing to die for my faith in that sense, he's making a hypothetical statement. But the importance remains that even if Paul was to surrender himself to death, if he had not love, then it is of no importance. I'm going to synthesize this for you and run real simple statement. Appearance is not important. What is beneath the surface is. So it doesn't matter all these things that are appear to be godly, because all the things he talked about are not bad things, right? These are the exercising of spiritual gifts. But ladies and gentlemen, we can exercise spiritual gifts as the body of Christ in a way that shows that if our heart is not in it, and we're not expressing love, then really it's losing the point and value of what it's meant to actually do. What's beneath the surface is what's important. You cannot read the scripture and not see that Christ is intimately concerned about our hearts. All the time we see this. It goes well beyond the surface level actions with Jesus. It always goes to the depth of the issue. God is always concerned with our heart. So even if people are active in church and using this spiritual gift, then that seems invaluable to ministry. But if you have a loveless, rotten attitude on the inside, which I can't see, but God sure can, then it doesn't make its no value. The kingdom of, we are not benefiting the kingdom of God by walking around using our spiritual gifts and having pa poor attitudes with it. Because our love needs to be backed up by the things that we actually do. So the question I want to ask you today is I want to give you an application point right here. Is what is your motivation? Because that is only a question that only you and God can answer. So I want you to think about for a moment, reflect on some of you, a lot of you here serve in some aspect in ministry here at Shady Rest. I want you to think about your ministry here at Shady Rest and even outside of this building. Think of the ways that God has gifted you and allowed you to use the spiritual gifts he has given you. And ask yourself a few questions. Do you serve out of, out of a genuine love for people and for Christ? Or do you serve just so that way you feel like you've done something and God can give you a favor in return? Do, where does it come from? Do you serve out of compulsion or just guilt for your own personal satisfaction? The only people that can see your heart are you and God. And remember, I know that no person serves. We, we're totally not perfect beings, okay? So I'm not saying that. I know in that way we can't have the absolute 100% purest of motives all the time. But I do think, and there is a noticeable difference between somebody who serves out of love and compassion toward people and another person who has a selfish agenda, okay? And that's the reality. So that's something you need to ask yourself, as I even asked myself when I was dealing with this and putting this together this week, is we need to lay that before God and put our heart on the line and just say, all right, Lord, I want to serve you, but check my heart and make sure that my heart is clean and pure in doing so. So the first thing we saw about this agape-type love, that it is greater than the exercise of any spiritual gift.
And the second thing we're going to see is how it's active. It's not static, okay? It's not complacent. But love is a verb. Let's pick up in verse 4. Verse 4 says that love is patient, love is kind, and it is not jealous. Love does not brag, and it is not arrogant. It does not act becomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Pick up verse 6. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, how, uh, hopes all things, and it endures all things. So I want you to notice something very significant about these, three, these four verses we just read. Number one is that Paul uses, as we said, verb ideas in order to communicate what he's communicating. In the short span of just four verses, four verses, Paul uses 15 different verbs that all have the word love as their subject. When he's talking about whether this is love or love isn't this way, 15 different action words that he uses in just four different verses. This is how greatly Paul is showing that your love is expressed in some of the things, how it's active in the things that you do, that it goes well beyond just having butterflies in my stomach, okay? But it has everything to do with the way that we live out our lives. So let's look at some of these because this is going to be very telling for us. The first thing he says is that love is patient. Now, the word translated patient actually means this, forbearing in respect to actual offenses and injury one receives from others. The King James, if you have King James, you'll notice the word long-suffering is the actual translation, which I actually like that word. It's the idea that uh, love is going to, it doesn't have a short fuse with people. You know how you meet people like that, that sometimes that can turn on a drop of a dime and just have a short fuse and they're, uh, they're angry? Well, love is patient in that way. It is willing to overlook some of the things that people do uh, that annoy us or things that people do toward us, and it's willing to not blow that short fuse. Secondly, it says that love is kind. Kindness and patience are always closely related, and kindness is that tender action toward people when you just have a sweet spirit toward people, other people. Often, however, that doesn't mean that kindness is soft, because sometimes kindness can take the form of a very careful rebuke when we see a brother or sister going in a way that the Lord has given us the opportunity to speak with them, to be able to encourage them to, uh, you know, in their walk with Christ. It says love is not jealous. We know all about jealousy, and you can't, and you read the scripture, and there's a lot of jealousy in the scripture right from the very beginning, right? We see that Cain envied Abel and killed him in Genesis 4. We saw that Jacob's sons were uh, jealous of Joseph, so they sold him into slavery. Jealousy is this it's resenting people for who they are and what they have. That's what jealousy is. It's resenting somebody for who they are as a person and what they have. And you know what really the root of jealousy is? It goes so far beyond exercising that toward another person. It really goes toward God, okay? And what jealousy really is in its heart of hearts is it's an ungrateful attitude toward God for who he made me to be and for what he provides for me. That's why I envy other people. That's why I'm jealous of their possessions. That's why I may be jealous of them personally because I am, because when that runs up in our spirit, basically, we are resentful toward God for who he made us to be because he made us unique and made us the way that we are and for everything that he provides for us. It says love does not brag or boast. Bragging and arrogance go hand in hand. Bragging is making too much of oneself, it's exalting oneself, it's conceit. When, you know, you ever meet people that are conceited, you know, it's just all about them in that way. Agape love is not about having a big head. It's about having a big heart. It's not about having a big head, but having a big heart. That's what it comes down to. Paul warned the Corinthians earlier in our uh, examination of 1 Corinthians in chapter 4 about arrogance. They were very arrogant and they're prideful of their knowledge. They can, you can even be prideful about how much you think you know about God. Even Christians can be prideful in that way. And that's exactly what Paul warned the Corinthians in in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He warned them against the arrogance because they were arrogant about their own knowledge about God and about the exercise of their own spiritual gifts. Without love... Knowledge just becomes arrogance. It says, love does not be, act becomingly, behave rudely, 
So love does not act in a way that's improper or inappropriate in some situations. Some people are just plain rude, okay? Some people have the gift of rudeness, okay? You know, you know the type of people I'm talking about. I'm talking about the type of people that would make you, ra- you would rather go hug a cactus than be around them. You know what I'm saying? Because those people are just plain rude. You just can't stand being around them. And that's not agape love. That's definitely not God type love when we're rude and inappropriate in situations. But then also it says love is not self seeking. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you are NFL fans, but remember back in the day when Terrell Owens used to actually be a wide receiver for the Philadelphia Eagles? I remember Terrell, I believe when he went to Dallas, had a quote, I love me some me. Remember that? He said, I love me some me. Now, he was known around the league for being a little self-centered and not being the best of teammates because it was all about him. And the person who functions in agape love puts the benefit of others above themselves. It's not all about you. That's not the way that God's love expresses itself because God's love is always sacrificial in nature. And the greatest expression of putting others before themselves is what we see, obviously, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus himself. Just read Philippians chapter 2. It says, love is not provoked, not easily angered. It doesn't become angry when we are wronged. It's slow to anger. It's basically the idea that people don't keep a long laundry list or record of the wrongs that are done against them. People who do not, people who love do not keep offenses or grudges. They forgive much because they have been forgiven much. Jesus and Stephen both demonstrated this type of love by forgiving people who put them to death. Remember, Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Remember, Stephen in Acts is literally on his knees praying as they are stoning him and basically saying the exact same thing. And that is love. It's not, love is not a bookkeeper. It's not like a person is keeping a ledger and saying, oh man, I remember, yep, 1998, they offended me this way. Okay, yep, there's one mark. Uh, Let's see, 2002, yep, there's another mark. So then after... That's not true forgiveness, and that's not the expression of love. True forgiveness says that if I say I forgive you, that means that I have erased the board. Because if I don't erase the board, then my heart will always be prone to bitterness. So the next time that you wrong me, then I go back to my laundry list and say, remember 1998, 2002, 2004, 2008. Man, I don't know why I keep on forgiving you because you're a dummy and you keep on doing the same stuff. But that's not the point. So it's not a bookkeeper in that way. It's not provoked. It's not easily angered. When a person forgives the actions done against them, it should never be mentioned again. God doesn't keep a ledger of your sin. We shouldn't keep a ledger of other people's toward us as well. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. How many of you, I can't stand going down the grocery aisle and the grocery aisles are just chock full of gossip magazines. You know, and they're always there when you're at the checkout stand, right? At the checkout stand, you always see these gossip mags, and you can't walk about, walk around them without seeing some headline about the latest Hollywood star who's in trouble. So, so so-and-so got a DUI, or he's cheating on his wife, or this and that, because our culture is enamored with the unrighteousness of people. We like our people flawed in that way, and we like to promote it, and it sells magazines in that way. Paul is clearly showing evil in light of that. He's saying it's not unrighteousness, but it's the truth. That's not God-type love. Love always seeks the truth and rejoices when good triumphs over evil. It says love bears all things. I love this one. Listen to this. The, The word that we translate bears can mean to endure, but it also means to cover. The implication is that love does not stop loving that it is more than willing to cover it's the idea of a roof okay think about a roof on a house a roof on a house is the cover over that house to protect it from water and from all the different elements basically getting inside right it protects from the hostile elements in that way first peter 4 chapter uh, chapter 4 verse 8 says that love covers over a multitude of sins it's the same word it's literally exactly what he's talking about if i could say it in a blunt way a very blunt way is love puts up with the crap okay it's willing to overlook that stuff it is protective in that nature it bears all of those things okay and it's willing to put up with the hard things in life 
It says love believes all things. That doesn't mean that love is gullible. That means that love is always hopeful because our love and our hope is based upon the person of Jesus Christ. So our love always hopes for the best thing and gives the benefit of the doubt. And lastly, it says that love hopes all things. Love gives rise to hope. Hope is an attitude that good will eventually come to those who may now be failing, and failure invades every Christian's life. It is a guarantee. It is a guarantee that I will fail you at some point as a pastor, and it's a guarantee that I will fail God. But thankfully, that's where grace comes into play. Because God doesn't keep those failures against us. Yet Christians who continue to love hope for the best. This optimism encourages others to keep moving forward. This hope is not based upon the actual Christian, but it's based upon Christ. Our hope is actually rooted in something. It's rooted in a person. The hope of the believer is based upon that. And each Christian, we believe, will continue to persevere in Christ and has the hope ultimately of eternal glory. And actually, the last thing he says is that love endures all things. That means that love perseveres. Paul had in mind the need of perseverance and love for others. Now, Christians should look to the length and perseverance of Christ's love as their own standard. Now, this word is interesting, too, because it's a military term, and it means that to hold your position at all costs. Literally unto death, whatever it takes. The battle may be lost, but the soldier keeps on fighting to the very end. This word pictures this idea that we are surrounded by an innumerable amount of forces that clearly will destroy us, and that no matter what, we're still holding our little area. And we're still going to hold on, and we're going to continue to fight. That's what love does for us. Though the noise of the battle comes and it's all around us, we will stand our ground even if that means to the very end. So if I can boil that down for you, I would simply say this, that love is shown through your actions and not your words. Because, ladies and gentlemen, you could tell somebody that you love them till you're blue in the face, but if your actions do not back up your words, then it shows no point. One of the things and one of the sad realities is that... um, Jen, having worked as a counselor, at one time I was a volunteer at a woman's, uh, at a domestic violence shelter, while Jen actually counseled people there as well. And there's so many different times when you see people who are abusers that always try to come back and they say that they love that person. I'm sorry, you don't love that person if you're hurting them. Your actions don't back up your words. The words there become pointless and void. Our love is always prompted by our actions as well. So it's one thing to say I love an individual. It's another thing to actually show it into practice. Let me give you a little story. In his book, Dad, the Family Coach, David Simmons, I love this story, tells of an act of sacrificial love that occurred during a, sh- uh, uh, during a trip to a shopping mall. One day he took his eight-year-old Helen and his five-year-old Brandon to the Cloverdale Mall. He needed to buy some tools and sears. When they pulled into the mall parking lot, there was a big sign that said Petting Zoo. Immediately, the kids jumped up and asked, Can we go, Daddy? Can we go? Please. Seeing that it would be no trouble at all and concluding that it may even make his trip quicker, Dave said, Sure, and handed both of his kids a quarter. They bolted bolted away as he headed for Sears. A few moments later, he was making his way down the aisle when he spotted Helen slowly walking up behind him. She looked at him and said, Well, Daddy, it cost 50 cents. So I gave Brandon my quarter. Then she said the most beautiful thing of all. She repeated their family motto. And this was their family motto. This is great. Love is action. What do you think he did? Not what you might have think. Dave finished his shopping and then took Helen back to the petting zoo. They stood there by the fence watching Brandon go crazy petting and feeding all of the animals. Helen stood with her hands and her chin resting on the fence just watching. Dave felt 50 cents in his pocket, almost burning a hole, but he never offered it, and she never asked for it. Helen was following through with the lesson that love is action. So love is not just action. Love is sacrificial action. Love always pays a price, and love always costs something. It is not cheap. And so this eight-year-old girl demonstrated the action of love toward her brother. And she rejoiced in seeing how happy he was. And the father, I mean, I, man, I couldn't imagine that. I would have been a proud daddy in that moment. 
We have already seen two things already about love. Number one is that love is greater than any spiritual gift, the exercise of any gift. And then secondly, we saw that love is an action word. It's a verb. And lastly, we'll see that love reigns supreme. Let's pick up in verse 8. So it says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. So love is timeless in comparison to the exercise of these gifts like prophecy, speaking in tongues. They're temporal in that sense. They're only for a designated amount of time. However, love is the only thing that is going to carry on into eternity. The perfection of things to come here really talks about the second coming of Christ, about this age. When the perfection comes, there's no need of those spiritual gifts. As we even talked about in 1 Corinthians 12, remember last week we talked about what is the purpose of the exercising of spiritual gifts. It is summed up in one short statement, for the common good. That's what we talked about last week. There's no need for the common good in that sense when we're in heaven. Okay, When we're with Christ, the exercise prophecy is not necessary. Speaking in tongues is not necessary. You know, gifts of healing and all this stuff, none of that stuff is necessary because the purpose of those spiritual gifts are that we may direct people and use them for the glory of God that they may see Christ, but we will see Christ. So when perfection comes, those temporal things go away at that point. Let's pick up verse 11. Paul's going to use two different actual word pictures then to actually make that point. Verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, and reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with those childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will f know fully, just as I have also been fully known. So Paul uses these two different word pictures to bring out the point he was just making. The first analogy is linked to our physical maturity. You don't do the same things you did when you were a toddler, okay? If you are, you know, 40 plus, 50 plus years old and you go back to wearing diapers and sipping on bottles, there's something wrong there, okay? Physical maturity is now taking place. You have grown from all the way from infancy then basically to adulthood. We see that there is, you put away those childish things. In the same way, the gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge are all limited by the context of this life that we live here on earth, and those things will be put away. We don't need them. It's unimaginable to think that you would go back to being a child, just like it's unimaginable to think that we would need those when we get to heaven. And then the second thing is he talks about looking in a mirror as a poor reflection, right? Paul's point is that the reflection is no substitute for the real thing. The closest thing I can think about in a modern context is think about a photo. Now, if you take a photo, now most of them are digital now, but I mean, if you take a digital image and email it to somebody and you're looking at it, or even if you print a photo, the photo has a resemblance. It is the person who you take the photo of, but it's not really the person you take the photo of. It's just an image. It's a reflection of who that person is. There is something significantly greater, obviously, between looking at a photo and reminiscing and thinking about a memory or thinking about a person and the person actually being there. And that's the point that he's trying to make. Because listen to what he says at the end of that verse. Go back to verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face... Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. So the reality is, is that that reflection, the reflection that we see of Christ through people and the exercising of their spiritual gifts as we do that for the common good, those things will be done away with because then our faith will literally become sight and in reality we will see Christ. And that's the greatest thing. When we actually see him, Forget about the reflections. Even this, don't get me wrong, I love the Word of God and I know the Word of God's alive, but man, when I see Christ face to face, I'd do a backflip if I could. Okay? There's just something different about that. It takes on a whole new dynamic when you see Him face to face. Listen to verse 13. It says, But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now we see these, this is kind of the 
triune uh, highest of high when it comes to Christian attributes in some way. But even in this context, it says love is the greatest. The inclusion of faith and hope allows Paul to magnify the idea of love even more. Not only is love superior to spiritual gifts that are partial and will come to an end, but love is also superior to any exercise of virtues that we exercise as Christians. And these, we would agree, are key elements to Christianity. Faith, hope, and love in that way. But love is the greatest of them. And this is the reason why. Think about this for a second. It makes perfect sense. Why is love the greatest of all of these gifts? And it's simply because of this. Love is eternal because the God of love is eternal. You don't have to hope anymore. Hope is when you have an expectation of something to come when it has already come. We don't have to have faith anymore to trust and believe God for salvation when salvation is fully realized. However, love is something that we will all exercise in eternity because as we even looked at before, the God whom we serve is love. Not only the God whom we serve is love, we are called to love one another. So that means that even in heaven, we're going to be exercising love. We are going to receive love from God. Romans 5 8 says that, for this is the love of God expressed, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Remember that? So in salvation, the fact that Jesus Christ died for us, we see the love of God expressed. And for all of eternity, we will continue to receive the love from God Himself directly. Not only that, as we will continue to show brotherly love to our brothers and sisters in Christ for all of eternity. It's the one thing that continues well beyond the realm of space and time. Because the God of all love, he's there. So love will always reign because you can't separate God from who he is. Heaven is going to be the greatest expression of love. I can't even imagine how great it's going to be. Literally, the God who loved me so much to die for me, I will literally see him face to face. And for all of eternity... He will shower me with that love as his child. And I will get to return it face to face with him as well. That's why love is the greatest of all these. It's the only one that goes on into all of eternity. Love is the basis of all human relationships. And it is the basis of our relationship with Christ. And it is the basis essentially of God's relationship to us as well. That's why it transcends all of these above all. In the eternal state, we will realize fully the love of God. And I can't wait for that day. Let me read to you a quick quote, and then I'm going to summarize this for you, okay? This quote comes from John MacArthur, and I believe this sums up really nicely why love is supreme. Listen to this. He said, love is the greatest of these, not only because it's eternal, but because even in this temporal life, meaning the here and now, where we live now, love is supreme. Love is already the greatest, not only because it will outlast these other virtues, beautiful and necessary as they are, but because it is inherently greater by being the most godlike. God does not have faith. God does not have hope, but God has love. Listen to that. I, that blew my mind when I read that this week. 1 John 4, 8, he bases that off of. But think about that. God doesn't express faith. God doesn't have to trust anybody. He's completely self-sufficient in himself. God doesn't express hope because God doesn't lack anything. However, God expresses love because he is love. So that's why it's the greatest of these virtues. Not only because of all of eternity and because that's part of God's nature, but even in the here and now. That reality reigns true. Let me summarize this for you. The first thing we saw, according to verses 1 to 3, is that appearance is not important, but what is beneath the surface is. We see that love is greater than any spiritual gift. And if we exercise any of those spiritual gifts without being flavored, spiced like you spice your food, without love, then they're of no value. And God is ultimately concerned with your heart. Secondly, we saw that love is shown through your actions and not just your words. Love is a verb. It is living. It is active. It is something that we are to exercise. We make the choice to consciously love every single day. It's a decision that you make, and it's shown by your actions that proceed from it. Love is something that can clearly be seen. See, a lot of times we can easily recognize when love's not being shown equally as much, we can easily recognize when it is. 
It's something that's so dynamic. And remember, 15 times in four little verses, Paul uses action words that relate to love. 15 times. And then lastly, love is eternal because the God of love is eternal. Love is supreme over all spiritual gifts and all the virtues of even hope and love, which are essential to the Christian life now. Love is supreme because faith and hope will be fully realized in our eternal state when we're with Christ. But love is supreme because it is the most God-like characteristic because the God that we serve himself is love. And I love that passage in 1 John. We don't even know what that means. I don't care. Hollywood can't tell you what love means. This is what tells you what love means. Okay? We can't even love according to 1 John until we understand Christ because Christ first loved us. The love of God is a beautiful thing. Let me give you one last application point. Why don't you show some love this week? I want you to think of a very tangible way to show love to someone in your life. Whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend, whether it's a neighbor, or even a complete stranger. I want you to think in a tangible way, an active way, something you can do in order to show love. Remember that it's a verb and it's about action. I'm not talking about giving a kiss to your spouse. Now, husbands and wives, don't take the easy road out and just try to say, oh, I kissed my spouse, I showed her I loved her. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You know what I mean. Think outside the box. You know that many of you, your spouse is probably more happy if you do something around the house and cross it off the honey to-do list. Maybe if you do something like that this week, that's a tangible way to show that you love your spouse. I'm thinking about something here that is tangible. Amen. That's right, Brother Bob. My wife, she, was, she didn't say it, but she was... Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, maybe you can help a friend with some housework around the house or babysitting for somebody so they can have a date night or something like that. There's no shortage of ways that we can bless one another and show that we love one another. So let's be, listen, this is my encouragement to you as a congregation. Let's be a people who do not merely communicate our love with our words, but let's be a community that communicates our love loudly with our actions. Amen? Let's communicate love and show love to those who are around us. And Jesus gives us plenty of opportunities to do that. So I'm encouraged to hear what you do this week. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are love and that you love us. Sometimes, God, we're really, I feel unlovable. But Lord, no matter how many times I fail you, you still love me. And thank you for calling me your child. Lord, it's just so amazing when we think about the love, this God-type love, this love that's expressed so much in the person of Christ that you came and died for us. And something that is so radical and countercultural, Lord, and can literally communicate volumes to the lives of people around us. I pray that we would be a people who walk in love at all times. And I pray that we'd be sensitive to your Holy Spirit for opportunities, God, that you would give us uh, just to be able to show love in a tangible way. There's so many different times when we can do that and we just overlook those opportunities. But I pray we'd be more sensitive to those this week. And that, God, that you would open our eyes to all of the needs that are around us, Lord, to where we can potentially meet some of those needs. I want to be a person, God, personally, who not only communicates love through my words, but through my actions. And I pray that that would be our heart's cry for all of us under the sound of my voice today. We thank you that we can look to your scripture to understand love, but we can also look to the person of Jesus to clearly see it in action. For that, we are eternally grateful. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us grace even when we fail in this area and give us numerous different opportunities to continue to show love again. And Lord, I pray that it would just overwhelm our hearts, that we would truly reflect Christ in everything that we say and we do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.